I'm happy with the overall look. It's just the sound that leaves me really thinking for $8.99, I feel like I should have gotten a more linear speaker. This is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner and welcome to another review. Today we have the Q Acoustics 5020. It is a new loudspeaker bookshelf size and runs about $8.99 per pair. This speaker was loaned to me direct from the manufacturer for me to review and I am sending it back once the review is done. Go ahead and get into things really quickly and quite easily. This is a speaker that is not well balanced in my personal opinion and looking by objective data. The overall treble is up at about three to five dB, depending on which particular frequency you're looking at. And that caused the speaker to sound very forward and also very sibilant, very bright, very treble heavy. And this really created a problem for me in my listening sessions. Now, luckily my preamp has the ability to adjust tonal balance. So I went to the high level on the treble and just dropped that down about four dB. Had it not been for that, honestly speaking, this speaker would not have been listenable to me. Now that's really with the speaker pointed both at me and then pointed out into the room about 30 degrees off axis. Either way I went, the treble was still too hot. Turning the speaker off axis, the treble was mellowed out just a little bit, but I still had to knock it down by about two to three dB on my preamp. The bass on this speaker is kind of bass shy, and it's really exasperated by the fact that the treble is so high, exasperated. I thought I was gonna fumble that as I was thinking it. But yeah, the treble being so high makes the mid-range sound mellow and it also makes the bass sound even weaker than it is. If I could do one thing with this speaker, I would throw an active equalizer into it and then just pad that top level from about one kilohertz down. I would drop that by about four dB or so, maybe play around with that range and see what I like about it. I think in doing that, it will result in a much more pleasant sound to me. Now, I'm not really sure why this particular speaker has this sound to it. And matter of fact, when I looked at the measurements and confirmed what I was hearing, I thought, well, is there something wrong with the speaker set? So then I actually measured the second speaker and then I got the exact same result. I did that because I know Amir at Audio Science Review has reviewed the lower line Q Acoustics. I think it's the 3020i. And that speaker has a more linear on-axis response than this particular one does. I'll show you that when I get into the data aspect. The overall look of the speaker though is really nice. I mean, personally speaking, the gloss black on the baffle and then the white shell of the speaker looks awesome. It comes in a couple different colors. And if you wanna check that on their website, you're more than welcome to do that. As you can see, I was loaned a white pair and that's actually the color that I preferred because normally speakers don't come in white. I mean, not all of them do. And I just wanted to do something a little bit different. I'm happy with the overall look. It's just the sound that leaves me really thinking for $8.99, I feel like I should have gotten a more linear speaker. Instead of just taking my word for it, let's actually go look at the data and you'll see what I'm talking about when I say the treble just sounded way too elevated. First, we're going to start off with the CEA 2034 measurements. And as you can see, there is certainly an elevation in the treble if you compare it to the mid-range and lower mid-bass area. Now, this looks to me like it's probably some sort of baffle step. And I actually wondered, was this speaker maybe designed to be placed near a wall? So I went and looked around online. I couldn't find anything about that in their manual or brochure. So it kind of left me in a lurch as to determine, well, am I using the speaker incorrectly? And I'm pointing this out because if you really like the look of the speaker and you're very interested in purchasing it, then you can try what I did, which is to put the speaker close to a wall. Now it's rear ported, so be careful with putting it too close to a wall. You don't wanna really block the purpose of the port, but in doing so, you'll get a little bit more bass. So that wall will act as a little bit more of a baffle and help support the upper mid range, lower mid bass type frequencies. That'll kind of help, but it really doesn't help a lot. And frankly, it actually introduces other issues that are unsolvable with basic equalization. The sound power and early directivity indices show there's some sort of directivity mismatch, and this is gonna be between the tweeter and the woofer. Just the fact alone that the tweeter is spaced so far above the mid woofer gives me an indication just by looking at it that there's probably gonna be some kind of vertical directivity mismatch. Now, vertical directivity mismatches the verdict's still out. We don't really know based off evidence and research how well we hear that. And if you wanna go back and watch my interview with Dr. Tool, you'll see that he told me that. 
I asked them the question. So I'll tend to focus on the horizontal response. And let's go and look at that. This is the horizontal response. This is taking all the different axes of measurements and comparing it to the direct on-ax sound. What you generally want is you want this red area to be linear in shape. When it caves in like this, that means going off axis, there's less energy in this one to three kilohertz area. And then above that frequency, you can see that there's additional energy. So there's kind of like a, a hole in the sound, if you will, that's reflected out into the room. It comes back at your ears. And that's going to make this speaker also sound a little bit bright. So it's not just the fact that it's a little bit bright on axis. It's the fact that the on axis and off axis sound results in a bright in room sound. And that's exactly what I heard. If we go look at the prediction, you can see what I'm talking about. Generally speaking, you do not want a flat on axis response in the room. If it were flat on axis in the room, then it's going to sound bright. So what we typically do is we just kind of draw an imaginary line. This speaker, if I were to draw in a target line through here, you would see that the upper frequency response is about 5 dB to as much as 7 dB over where I would draw this imaginary line. And that's exactly what I heard. The S's really stood out, like stood out. And it was very annoying. And without padding the treble in my preamp, I could not listen to this speaker. In terms of amplifier power, how much power you're going to need, this speaker is somewhere in that mid sensitivity range. And I measured it at about 87 dB based on 2.83 volts input at one meter distance. Now that's an average sensitivity. If you're just looking at the upper frequencies, then yeah, they could spec it out as high as they wanted to as much as maybe even 90, 92 dB. But on average, you're looking at about 87 decibels. And you can see based on this average right through here that the F3 is 103 Hertz and the F10 is 48 Hertz. Now this basically just shores up my notion that the bass is kind of weak on the speaker. I didn't expect it to be really boisterous, but I wish there was more to it. I really think that has a lot to do with the upper treble being raised so high. Let's talk about output capability. At more moderate levels, you're looking at less than 1% distortion to about 50 Hertz. And then at higher output levels at 96 dB at one meter, you're looking at about 3% distortion at 100 Hertz. So for the most part, I'd say the distortion levels on this speaker are pretty dang good. And the one thing I really want to note is that the second harmonic distortion is the highest, but look at the gap between the second and the third. So that's good, clean distortion, if you were to call it any kind of distortion. We don't really want distortion, but we would prefer to have an even order distortion that's closer to the fundamental as opposed to an odd order that's further away from the fundamental because those odd order distortion tones are going to be more audible. So overall, in terms of distortion, the size of the speaker, I think it's got a pretty good distortion profile. Now we're going to look at compression testing and at high output volumes, 102 dB, the compression is pretty significant on the lower end and on the very upper octaves. But in that typical listening range, this 86 to 96 dB at one meter, that translates into somewhere in the 80 dB to 85 dB range in most listening rooms at a certain seating distance. This speaker is going to do okay. Now on the low, low end, below 50 Hertz, you might, you might give up the ghost here. It might bottom out on you. You'll have to be careful. When I was really cranking on it, I got the woofers to bottom out, but for the most part, I never really ran into that issue because I wasn't listening to them that high. I didn't need to. Something else I wanted to show you guys, and I rarely go through the trouble of showing near field measurements. What I do is I put the microphone right at the tweeter, right at the woofer, and right at the port. And I do that to give me the contribution of each into the overall frequency response. And this is a good way to kind of get an idea of where the crossover region is and to see if there's any kind of extraneous noise caused by the enclosure, maybe a vibrating enclosure or by maybe a poor port resonance. So what I wanna look at first is this gap in frequency response. And this indicates to us that this speaker is using a very shallow, most likely first order-ish slope on the woofer and then a higher slope on the tweeter. And this right here is what's causing that off axis sound at the one to three kilohertz region to be much lower than it is in the higher frequencies because there's just not as much energy shared as you go away into the side of the speaker. The other thing that's worth pointing out is here's the port response, but we see a pretty strong resonance right around one kilohertz. And that's gonna come off as very uh, sharp and stringent in certain songs, or maybe not even certain songs, just if it happens to hit that note, then you're gonna hear it. Now I'm gonna come back to what I heard when I was listening to the speaker. And a couple ways that I would like to describe this is, the speaker is too crisp. It's just, it's too edgy, too trebly. Now, some people may like that, but 
I don't. And if you generally prefer a more neutral speaker, then this speaker isn't for you. Another thing that really annoyed me about that upper treble is that when vocalists would modulate their vocals, and let's say they would go from like a mid frequency to an upper frequency. So maybe they would go from 500 Hertz to two kilohertz, just they're trying to modulate their own vocal. You could definitely tell the difference in the levels. And again, that's easily attributable to the frequency response that we see. I mean, that's, it shows up right there as plain as day. And we know why that speaker has the sound that it does then. And I just don't like that. It's, it draws attention to itself and I don't care for that. I mentioned earlier that Amir had measured the 3020i. So what I'm gonna do is pull up the response of that speaker real fast from his website. And then I'm gonna flip back to the response of this speaker. And I'm gonna say just my two cents on it. As a refresher, here is the CEA measurements for the 5020 that I'm reviewing in this video. And then now we have the measurements from the 3020i that is roughly half the cost. And you can see that it is indeed a more linear speaker. Now it's not the most linear speaker, but it is a more linear speaker than the 5020, which really leaves me kind of puzzled and makes me think that, yeah, Q Acoustics was targeting the response that they got. And that response, if you like a neutral speaker, is not what the Q Acoustics 5020 is doing. And therefore was not really why I cared for it. I'm not saying it has to be a perfect speaker for me to like it, but the elevated treble was just way too much for me. So overall, that's my opinion of the speaker. To wrap it up, my conclusion is quite simple. It's a gorgeous speaker. It's not linear. I didn't care for it. That's pretty much it. If you enjoyed this review and you got something from it, please leave a thumbs up at the bottom. If you're not subscribed, please consider subscribing. And if you're interested in kind of seeing what I'm doing behind the scenes and seeing some sneak peek information, please consider joining my Patreon at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. And that would be greatly appreciated. I will see you all in the next review. Take care. Peace.